Mm -hmm. Cyride. So yes. we're actually transit system, I would say. So. Yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, we'll start off um, with the first slide. And just to give you kind of an overview of um, some of the highlights of, of the budget. Before I do that, though, I, I put in pictures this year of kind of lesser known areas of Cyride that I thought maybe you might be interested in. So this particular picture is um, our, what we call our kitty tours that we do in the summer. Um, from uh, the time the school is out until uh, the 1st of August. And we last year, I think we did 358 different tours for kids um, over the summer, um, brought them to SciRide, they experienced the bus, and, and we're excited about transit. So just a little bit of, of background there. Uh, as far as the overview, um, a couple of things I just wanted to highlight um, in this budget. Um, the first one is last year, the emphasis uh, in the budget was on getting SciRide 2.0 um, implemented uh, and really what that meant was kind of rebalancing uh, the service levels with the demands in different areas of town or, or routes. Um, this year in this budget the, the emphasis is going to be on making modifications to adjust that and, and you'll see, I'll, I'll explain in a little more detail here exactly what that means uh, to the budget, uh, but we're looking at a service reduction and then some improvements as well in order to um, make it more uh, uh, convenient for our customers to use our service. We spent a lot of time in, in listening to our customers over the summer and the fall and uh, worked with the board on then um, identifying modifications that would um, improve the service from what we have today. So um, another highlight is we do have additional federal dollars this year for the first time in uh, quite a while. Um, we get a portion of our money from a, a program called Small Transit Intensive Cities um, funding. Obviously, we're a small city with high ridership, so we, we fit well in that category. Um, this is the first year that they bumped the amount of money in that program up, and so we're anticipating somewhere in the area of $250,000 more in federal funds uh, to support basically the new services that, that we'll be talking about. And then the last thing I wanted to kind of uh, talk to you about as a highlight was ridership. That's kind of the big story at SciRide and what's been going on, which uh, is, is illustrated by this graph here, but we are looking at a kind of a ridership decline period. Um, as you can see in the red is where historically where we've been over the last uh, eight or, or 10 years. Um, and you can see we, we rapidly grew, started to decline, and we're still on that de decline. And the reason why is our ridership mirrors what is happening at Iowa State. So as enrollment has declined this last year, I was about a thousand students different. That tends to have a pretty big impact on our ridership as well. So that's the, the main reason why uh, you see those declines. But where we think we'll be, um, you know, in the next 10 year period is somewhere between six and six and a half million rides um, as the, the Iowa State enrollment fluctuates as well. So just to kind of give you an idea of where that's, that we're looking at for that. And the next slide um, on page 124 is the Transit Administration and Support Area. Um, again, this is the revenues is uh, and the graphic there. You can see student government continues to be the largest portion of our um, revenues. Um, Iowa State, along with that, they're all over half of our budget. Um, and then you can see that's followed by the city and federal dollars about the same um, in supporting SciRite in the next year. Um, one highlight on the transit levy, um, Dwayne Noyes calculates that for me, and we're at 62.811 cent, 62 cents per thousand valuation. And again, just to give you a comparison on that, um, the state of Iowa allows up to 95 cents per thousand valuation to be levied for purposes within the community. So we're well below that um, uh, cap there as well. Student fees, uh, the story there, we did ask for a $5.50 increase for this budget per semester. Um, that would uh, make the student fee per semester per full-time student $85.10. So uh, we are increasing <clears throat> that as well as we move forward. What's the fare box number represent? Pardon, pardon me? That fare box, I assume that's like people who pay as they get at, on the bus. Basically at the fare box, yes, when you get on. So that's cash and tickets. Uh, and what, do you happen to know the dollar amount? Um, we uh, It's been declining. We're at about... <clears throat> Don't quote me on this. I want to say off the top of my head, it was about $250,000 we're bringing in per year in fare box revenue. Thanks. 
Um, on the expense side, some changes in this year's budget. Um, we do have one additional FTE um, this year for a chief safety officer. Um, the federal government uh, and their emphasis on safety and security is requiring transit systems of our size to have a chief sa safety officer. So we have to add that position uh, within our operations. Um, also, this, uh, this budget also includes the labor proposals that we've given to the union and then also um, increased insurance as we stay in compliance with Affordable Care Act as well. So. Um, some of the projects under Transit Administration and support, um, we talked about a couple of these along with the capital plan, the facility and the electric buses are, are major priorities or major projects um, that we continue to work on next year. Um, also, mon obviously, monitoring our ridership and modifying our service and listening to our customers uh, and seeing if there are things that we can do to modify the service even further. Um, and then um, grants that will uh, be the development of, you know, any facility actions that we want to take or electric bus. Uh, and then also implementing those new safety and, and uh, regulations. The picture on this one is uh, a program that we have at SciRide um, called SciRide Around the World. So um, people can take a paper bus stop with them as they travel around the world, take a picture of it as they're using public transit in that um, com new community and um, send that to us and we have a, a, on our website all of these pictures. So it's kind of, kind of a fun program for everybody. On the fixed route side, on page 126, I did identify all of the service changes that the transit board approved um, for inclusion in the budget the next year is uh, uh, quite a list, um, as you can see. Um, and then the one service reduction is on the gold route and reducing that. We think uh, we can save um, save a little bit of money to pay for some additional services that our customers wanted and not have an impact on that particular route as well. So um, a lot of detail there. Um, I could go through, it, through that if you're interested, um, but we have information on our website as well uh, that's in more detail on exactly what all these changes are. Um, again, the projects for fixed route this year is implementing those new services that um, was on the previous slide, um, moving the technology forward, which we just we discussed with a capital improvement plan, um, and then assisting um, with uh, monitoring of our ridership as we move forward to, to make sure that our service levels are matching our demand. The last uh, section uh, for us is dial a ride on page 128. Um, and again, this picture here is, um, we work with our cu dial ride customers. Um, this particular individual got a new um, wheelchair and a little bit bigger than what the normal is. And uh, she actually came to the facility. We worked with her to try and uh, to help her figure out how she could maneuver um, the chair within our vehicle safely. Um, and so we, we do do those kinds of things for our customers as, as they're needed as well. So. Um, the trend in dial, in dial ride is declining. Um, as we've looked at that and uh, worked with our contractor who is HERDA, um, the declining, uh, the number of people that are, that are on our program are declining. Um, and then those that are on our program, not all of them, but quite a few of them are taking fewer rides as well. So those two um, in combination have, have seen our ridership decline from about 13,000 um, <clears throat> rides uh, per year down to about 9,500. So a significant drop in that. So um, obviously the cost per rider then increases as you're trying to spread those expenses over fewer riders. Uh, so in discussions with HERDA, we are going to, to start looking at some marketing efforts to try and target those individuals that we think can benefit from the program to make sure they're knowledgeable of it and, and can take advantage of it um, if, if they desire to do that. So, and again, dial a ride, just for those that, that might not um, know what that is, that is um, the service that SciRide pays for contracts with HERDA uh, for the disabled community and providing door-to-door -door service uh, for those folks as well, so. Carrie, before we leave there, so yeah. um, I understand they're declining, but I assume the population <clears throat> is still there. So why, do you have any sense of why is this declining? Uh, it, 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 it's something we, we struggle with, trying to understand exactly why. Um, I can tell you from the, the data that we have, um, the, this declining um, as individuals uh, pass away or move out of the community, 
Um, so, and we just haven't been adding the number of people back on that we typically would do with that. So um, that's why, again, I think the marketing effort you know, between Herda and ourselves and getting out to the human service agencies um, and making sure that they're aware of the program. And if they have clients, they're directing them to that program and how to do it, I think um, can, could benefit the community. And, and we'll see if that the numbers go up because of that. I don't know. I don't know the total disabled community. I don't know if that's uh, decreasing or staying the same. I don't know that. But I just know our program has been declining. Some of it may be too, um, when the state of Iowa uh, stopped reimbursing agencies for transportation services, not December 2018, but December 2017, all of the agencies had to learn how to absorb those costs and take care of transportation on their own. And, and some of them just may have, as part of that absorbing of the other rides, absorbed other types of rides too that sure. maybe, maybe people were using Dial-A-Ride for before. Very well could be. Yep. Okay. So that in a nutshell is that right? Any other questions? Any questions? So I understand this may be your last budget you it present is. to us. Yes. I think maybe is incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to talk her out of it. Yeah. <clears throat> Jerry, you've been with the city for how long? Uh, just a little over 12 years. Oh. Yeah, it's been great. I've loved every minute of, of being at SciRite. It's a great organization. Uh, the support that we get from the community, you know, the council, the board, um, staff is outstanding. I, I just, I can't say enough. It's been a, an outstanding opportunity for me, and I appreciate the opportunity. So You've provided uh, essential leadership during a time of enormous change at SciRite, so you have to feel a sense of accomplishment that uh, many of the things that we have in place are there because of your service. So. We really appreciate that. And again, it is a team effort. It's not just me. I, I have great staff that uh, we work together and, and uh, figured out how to make that work. So, yeah. Thank you, though. So I'm, I'm curious, in your 12 years, what's uh, one, one milestone that you could point to that you think has really been, you know, big for SciRide? Let's reflect on it. Um, and your team. I would say the most transformational um, project has been the system redesign in SciRide 2.0. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you are doing a major change of the entire system that impacts everybody in the community um, and trying to get that the best it can be, um, I think has been probably the biggest challenge. So, um, you know, besides that, it's just, you know, finding the, the, the funds to keep up with the growth, particularly the buses. Now we're struggling and having discussions about the facility. So I think the infrastructure part of that growth was probably the most challenging part as well. So, so looking forward, that's going to be the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that you see for SciRide is, is facilities or buses or what? Uh, moving forward. Um, I think the biggest challenge is going to be budget. Um, as the enrollment declines at Iowa State, that means that's less revenue for SciRide. Um, so maintaining the existing level of service um, with less revenue is gonna be probably the biggest challenge um, I would see in the, the short term anyway. Okay. So, okay. Well, great. I know we're gonna miss you and thank you for your great. service. Well, thank Tim you very said, much and, for the uh, Appreciate it. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, item B, <coughs> City Council. <laughs> Are we talking to ourselves or? <laughs> Why is your budget up so high? <laughs> so, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, tonight I'll be presenting both the City Council's budget and the City Manager's. So both budgets are fairly small and straightforward. So I'm going to be highlighting some of the events the council participated in throughout the year and some of the areas the city manager's office um, has supported. So starting with the city council's budget. Um, so one of the main duties of the city council is to establish um, goals for the community. And last week, um, you all met for your council goal setting retreat, where you not only um, 
uh, evaluate the progress of your goals, but you also set new tasks and objectives for staff to complete. That's a great picture of Chris, by the way. Can you blow that up anymore? Besides laughing. Just There's another that out. For those who are watching, up in the upper right-hand corner, that's Chris Nelson looking very deep in thought. <laughs> so moving on to the events um, that council participates in. Um, so council participates in a variety of events throughout the year, and some of these events include our annual um, events and such as the city council night at the band shell, um, which includes a performance by the municipal band um, and give council a chance to interact with uh, residents while passing out cookies. Um, another event is that you guys take part in is the 4th of July um, pancake breakfast, which is held um, in front of city hall, another community building activity. Um, and council also participates in a variety of events um, held by the Ames Main Street and the Campus Town Action Association. One of the more fun events that council takes parts in is Welcome Fest, um, where you not only welcome students to the ISU campus, um, but also to the Ames community. Okay. So, um, Last year, we resurrect the mayor's bike ride, and we renamed it the mayor and council's bike ride, um, where we rode from City Hall to Hayden Park. Um, this, we're in, currently in the planning stage um, for the next council bike ride, so stay tuned for that. And these are other events that council participates in. Um, so um, the campus safety walk, um, the bike to work week breakfast, and um, Ragbri was here last year, so you took part in that. And that's it for the huh? council's budget. Any <laughs> questions? Why do we look so wide? <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. So moving on to the city manager's budget. Um, so the city manager's office provides the overall um, administrative um, direction for the various city departments and help with the coordination of um, their services. So some areas of major project support that the city manager's office has been involved in include the SunSmart Ames Community Solar Project. Um, we're still looking to boost our participation rates. Um, so we have been looking to identify new partners. Um, the Ames Plan 2040s underway. Both Susan Guiazza and Kelly Deakman is working on some outreach activities. Um, as far as the Healthy Life Center, the city manager has been overseeing the city's involvement and coordination with our various partners. And we have been in union negotiation with three bargaining units. Um, and Brian and Bob are overseeing that. Um, the city manager staff also supports um, six of our 18 boards and commissions. Um, both myself and Brian and Bob um, helps to ensure that um, those commissions and boards are um, addressing council goals and objectives. So um, staff also support council initiatives and community events. Um, this includes making sure that council goals are implemented, um, that council referrals are addressed and are responded to. Um, last fall, we launched the Ames Community Institute, um, which was the idea of members of a community advisory group um, to the city manager that was formed to address the needs of our increasingly diverse community and who are committed to a more inclusive Ames. The ACI is a four-week program designed to offer a cross-section of Ames residents an opportunity to learn about local government the participants were asked to provide input and recommendations on how to optimize diversity and inclusion within the city of Ames programs and operations. And so this is a picture, the picture on your screen, screen is the inaugural cohort. So I'd like to conclude um, by acknowledging um, Bob Kindred who will be retiring in the spring. <laughs> and Bob has been with the city for 38 years and a half. And that's the city manager's office budget. 
Any questions? No. Oh, okay. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> now we're going to ask lots of questions. <clears throat> Hello. How are you? Okay. Long time no see. <laughs> so, um, I will present the city clerk's division budget. We'll go over revenues first. Uh, our budget is relatively small, but the bulk of our revenue does come from uh, beer permits and liquor licenses. So last year we issued 185 licenses to 159 establishments. That included 136 on-premise consumption type licenses, that means the bars and the restaurants. And we had 49 off-premise, which are the convenience stores, grocery stores, those types of establishments. Um, periodically, I get requests to know how many wine tastings uh, are allowed. Well, the wine tastings themselves, um, there's not a limit, but there are only six establishments who have applied to conduct wine tastings. And in order for those to be approved, they have to submit a compliance plan to the police department, which has to be approved. And we have to have their dram shop insurance uh, on file in our office. So those six establishments are Chalk Lottery Stom, Cyclone Liquors, Hy-Vee Number 2, Hy-Vee Drugstore, um, and mm -hmm both fairway stores. Now, all of the on-premise licensees are allowed to have wine tastings at any time without asking special approval from the city. Uh, as far as five-day permits um, or licenses, you issued a record number 32, or approved, you approved a record number 32. Uh, 10 of those were part of a special event that you approved. Uh, so three of those were special class B, that's beer and wine. Uh, three were class C liquor, uh, which is not all that usual. That's like um, allowing anything that would be served in a bar to be served. And four were class B beer, <clears throat> which the in the past, the most common um, was the special class B, which is the beer and wine. One of those events occurred in Campus Town, and seven were on property owned by Iowa State University. We don't have jurisdiction over their property, but we are the local authority. You are the local authority, who, and they have to bring their alcohol uh, licensing request to the city. Um, and three were in the downtown area, and two were at a private facility, Ames, Lord, uh, Ames Ford Lincoln. Uh, so as far as the fees, um, we, the city received 65% for all of the liquor licenses. So we, we, we actually received $1,318 per license of the total amount paid, which is 2028. Uh, we do get 100% of the fee paid for beer permits. Um, we do not get any revenue at all from Sunday sales permits. That all goes to the state. And as I tell you every year, um, that fee has remained the same for the past 34 years. So um, it hasn't changed since 1985. Uh, another source of revenue for us is the um, miscellaneous permits and licenses category. We do have 15 other licenses and permits that we issue. Um, last year we issued 635 permits that's only 18 more than last year. And um, the two categories with the most activity are ironically the two that we don't charge for. So um, those are the temporary obstruction permits. 139 were issued last year. And notary, uh, notarizations and certifications. Um, and we performed 257, which is definitely trending upward because banks um, and credit unions have started to charge 
for that service. So we do not charge and the word gets out. And, and um, so we are busy doing that. Um, transient merchant permits. I wanted to visit with you a little bit about this. So 25 of the 30 that we actually issued were for the selling of fireworks. And um, that is down significantly since the passage of your ordinance because 47 were issued prior to that. <clears throat> so to put that in perspective, in 2015-16, we only issued eight for the whole year and those were for all transient selling. So that has gone up considerably. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. It costs $35 and it's valid for 60 days. Um, so relating to other permits, we had 27 vending <coughs> permits. Fee waivers were requested um, and approved for 10 of those. So those do cost $50 a year. Um, so we did collect that fee from the other 17. Also a very small amount of our budget um, revenue comes from mm -hmm. development application fees. Um, so we don't even get that every year. It depends on annexations. That's about the only fee that we get. We do get $25, $25 out of 200. Uh, 13 zoning board of adjustment meetings were held and there were 23 cases fought, uh, filed. <laughs> Those filing fees range from 75 to $150 and we get one third of that. So it doesn't build a lot of money for us, but regarding expenses, publishing legal notices, minutes and ordinance is by far our largest expense. So we budgeted 40,000 for this fiscal year. And I believe that's um, an accurate estimate at this time. 60% um, of our budget has been expended, but that's about where we are as far as the time of year that has elapsed. Last fiscal year, um, we were close to that. We paid $42,494. And we don't have any control over that. The legislature sets the fee that newspapers will charge. Um, so we try to keep our notices as informative as possible in the shortest amount of space. So another expense is recording. So last year we actually um, recorded 150 documents and um, that equated to $1,728. Uh, that is going to go up according to the recorder. Um, the fee is $7 for the first page, $5 for the second, but they are adding some additional fees for um, transfer of property and groundwater hazard statement and that will go up on July 1st. Um, our files oh, and elections. So there'll be three uh, positions on the ballot for city council on come November. I'm budgeting 20,000. I've also learned from the Story County Auditor that their fees are increasing. Um, she estimated more like 28,000 for, for our portion. Um, they have increased the amount they pay to the poll workers and they're adding poll workers to each precinct. <clears throat> Oops, let's see, I gotta do this. Okay, so I wanted to give you the stats from our records management system. So now we have about a thousand document searches performed monthly. We've brought in 51 city staff so they can do their own searches and they can view, print, and email documents. Um, we have 100,000 documents. Uh, it's 104,281 documents in our active files. That doesn't include our files that are slated for destruction or those that automatically um, move to inactive after five years. So as you know, this um, is all based on our records retention schedule, which has its... Um, compliance with the Iowa code. So that tells us when we can destroy documents. We also query expirations from our files management system and I issue about 40 reminders per month to department heads um, that certain documents, uh, agreements, um, easements, things like that are going to expire and then they need to get working on those or let us know if we are going to allow them to 
uh, expire. We also um, track 73 insurance certificates um, monthly, and um, I'm sorry, 73 on average expire monthly. We actually uh, track over 245. So we have to make sure that we always get an updated one if the project is still ongoing. Uh, so also, I want to pay tribute to our volunteers. Some of them told me that they will be watching. <laughs> so I want to thank them and note that um, we have seven volunteers. They donated 1,103 hours of service last year. I have two, the longest serving is Brian Esplin, who has been with us for 23 years. He works two days, two mornings um, a week. And Mindy Boney um, works every Friday afternoon and she's been with us for 21 years. So my favorite part of my presentation. So you know your, citizen, or your service to the citizens requires a great deal of time. Obviously in the last week you've, you've been together uh, five times. So um, you do devote a lot of time and it's um, the majority of it is spent right here in the council chambers. So you did have 50 meetings in fiscal year 2017-18. The total number of hours was 171 and that equates to an average of 3.42 hours per meeting, which by the way, is up slightly from 2.6 <laughs> hours per meeting during the last slightly. fiscal year. Slightly? <laughs> and that was a bit skewed because um, you had four special meetings that lasted fewer than five minutes, so that brought your average down a little bit. <laughs> now, obviously, you invest a lot of time here, um, but you also really did accomplish a lot. So you did adopt... 694 resolutions, which is a great many. Um, and uh, you adopted 48 ordinances and um, you had 1,039 items on your agendas. So I'd say that's a lot of work in a short period of time. And that's all I had. Do you have any questions for me? Great, thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm here to go over the Public Relations Office budget, which is on page 212 in your books. Um, several years ago, um, the office got together to de uh, define a mission for what we uh, aspire to each day, and that's branding a positive city identity. We want the city of Ames to be recognized as the premier provider of municipal services in a vibrant, innovative, progressive university community. So that kind of centers us each day on what we want to do. I know that I'm the person that you see the most frequently, but it is not just me in the office. Um, and uh, I work a lot with Derek Chrysler, who will be up here in just a few minutes to talk about his um, special area. But also we get assistance from uh, part-time help, including Christy Marnin, who works with me in public relations, and Derek's part-time staff, Alicia, Kate, and Allison. And I'm sure he'll thank them. We thank them a lot for the work that they do. Um, they are a very important part of getting the work done. Um, a lot of uh, stuff goes on behind the scenes, and they're sort of the ones that are um, watching the calendar and making sure things get out on time. Some of the tools that we use in the office are fairly traditional and I've been coming forward to you for several years with these tools. Um, um, press releases, we do um, still do over 150 a year, which averages out to you know more than three a week. Sometimes I think you probably get three from me in a day. Other times it, you know, it's a little bit of a drought. Um, but they're still effective. And of course, we wouldn't continue to use them if we didn't think that they worked. Uh, we do newsletters, and I think these should all look very familiar to you. City Side and City Slickers are both monthly newsletters. Uh, City Side is the external newsletter that goes out in the utility bill, in the utility bills. And then City Slickers is the way that we communicate with our employees. And um, Steve writes an excellent monthly column in that every 
month and um, talks a lot about excellence through people. Um, neighborhood news you might not be as familiar with. It is a quarterly publication that goes out to 1,800 to 2,500 um, neighbors. Uh, they are, um, it's, a, it's a list that we revise every year or so to the most active neighborhood associations. So that's why the number varies a little bit. But it tends to be kind of uh, very short um, articles about of interest to neighborhoods and neighbors and a calendar of important events. And it's uh, a postcard and it's sort of meant to be something you might put on your refrigerator just to remind you of what's coming. Some of the other tools that we use, of course, social media. Um, Facebook just celebrated 15 years of being part of our society. And um, I listened to an interesting radio show on if that's been good or bad. <laughs> and I think the jury is still out on that. It, we, what we do know is that it is a very popular form of communication. And um, I know that we have been on it as a city since 2009. So it's pretty entrenched in what we do. And um, we know it's effective when we know that we reach people through it. So we have, um, you know, it will always be part of our communication toolbox. We have expanded into Instagram um, and we also still use Twitter. I do sort of watch the trends on social media to see what people are using and what they're not using. Um, we have a strategy in place when we want to start more of these pages because um, uh, I think we jumped on board pretty quickly with a lot of them, and then we realized, well, they take a lot of work to sustain. So uh, now if somebody comes to me with the idea that they think that we need a new Instagram page or um, a new Twitter feed, we talk about who might be feeding that and taking care of it rather than just jumping in and figuring that out later. Um, our website continues to be one of the most popular ways people receive information. And uh, we try to keep that current. One of our concerns right now has been um, making sure that our website is accessible to everybody. And so um, we continue to watch ways that we can improve our website. So if you uh, are using an e-reader, it, it, it's easier for you to get the information. That is a work in progress. We will continue to work on that. Um, the website, I think I've explained before, has about 40 to 50 administrators throughout our uh, organization that contribute to it. It's very active. Um, very few pages are static. So we have a lot of people that are going in each day and making um, changes to it. While that's great, so it doesn't all funnel through one or two people, um, not everybody thinks the same way or stores information in the same place. And sometimes we end up with redundancy or we get things changed one place and not another. And so we have to um, kind of regroup and talk to one another. So we continue to work on that. Um, as we, as you all know, we do a lot of recognition events. If those, those can be ribbon cuttings, um, celebrations, anniversaries, um, we continue to look for ways to, to celebrate. And then we continue to track the success of our tools by uh, using the resident satisfaction survey. One of the areas of focus um, that has been fairly important uh, in, in the last couple of years has been sustainability. Uh, I think it was suggested that we try to aggregate our sustainability efforts on the website to one area, and we're working on that right now, as well as kind of inventorying the videos that we've done that are focused specifically on sustainability and other efforts that we have going on. Um, Sun Smart Ames has been talked about. We just finished the Smart Business Challenge. Uh, luncheon recently where we recognized several Ames businesses that have gone above and beyond in their efforts to be more sustainable. Um, you heard the worst waste diversion study recently and we'll continue to work on some of the efforts from that. Um, we have a lot of rebates. I think aggregating all of our um, sustainability efforts on one page will help kind of um, aggregate those rebates in one area too. So that might make it easier for our residents to find them. And then, of course, our big sustainability event for the last couple of years has been the Eco Fair. Um, you might notice uh, in the photographs is a picture of Steve Wilson, who actually started the Eco Fair as the Energy Fair many, many years ago. It was um, uh, he was the <laughs> it was his idea, and he has kind of been the driving force behind it. This will be our first Eco Fair without him. Um, but we will recognize his efforts at this event. And we're looking at ways to improve this eco fair to be even bigger and better. One of the other events that we've done is Rummage Rampage. I just thought that these pictures were kind of fun. <laughs> I know you guys have all been involved in it and have been and seen what a great event it is. It grows each year. 
And one of the more unique items that we received <laughs> this past <laughs> summer at the Rummage Rampage was decorative, and we made sure that they were decorative coffins. Oh my God. And that is my daughter who wanted to try it out. <laughs> <laughs> it fit. They sold pretty quickly. And they did sell. <laughs> so um, I send these out to you regularly, but I always like every chance I get to um, continue to promote them. We have many events coming up in 2019. Um, and um, just a reminder that, you know, your calendars are busy. It's, it's a, it's, it's a full-time job just uh, being on the council and showing up at these. And we do appreciate your support at these events. Um, and they, and they are fun. Uh, finally, I'm going to turn it over to Derek Chrysler, who's going to talk a little bit about our efforts um, in media production, unless you have questions for me. I have one question about the uh, accessibility for the website. Yes. Are we using tools to determine the accessibility or is it just sort of a, uh, a human endeavor of, of looking through the various pages? So we invested in some software called Sight Improve, and it does identify issues with um, like fonts that are too small or the wrong color, um, design um, design features that are problematic. Um, we are um, addressing those as they come up. It doesn't get everything. And so it does take a lot of manual going through the pages and looking for things that are wrong. Um, we are trying to get e-readers ourselves to see what our pages are like for somebody else. And then we've talked about this idea of having um, a focus group of residents who maybe use assisted technology and getting some feedback from them on what is problematic. Um, it's kind of, a, it's a, well, it is a difficult task because um, there are lots of e-readers out there. And while it might be good for one, it may not be as good for another. And so um, what we are finding through our own research and trial and error is really the simplest <laughs> And sometimes the most boring page is the best. So any other questions? I might just add that the uh, mayor's and council bike ride is actually on May. I mean, bike the work week is the 13th. That's a Monday. But the 18th, that Saturday, will be the uh, bike ride. So, And I will continue to update these you through email and um, make yep. sure that you have those dates. So there are some tentative dates up there. But... Um, those are the ones I know of right now. So. Any other questions for Susan? Thank Great you. job. Thank you. Jim. So you're on the other side of the camera now. It feels very weird. <laughs> Be sure to speak up into the microphone. Into the microphone. Right yeah. here. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. You know, I use that little monitor. Uh, too, Steve or? said he would help me out with this yeah. fancy stuff here. <laughs> Is this a button I push? I don't know. Okay. Hmm. Uh, I would like to start out by thanking the, uh, the part-time staff that helps me out in my office. Uh, Allison is in the back right now broadcasting it, so I may be out here in front of you guys. We also get great help from Alicia, Kate, and we do have two other that help us out in the summer with their municipal band concerts and Danielle and Lindsay. So thank you very much to them. Without them, a lot of what we do could not be possible. Um, First off, very honored to win the second place national award for a documentary for the water treatment plant documentary. That was a long project. Several of my staff helped with that because that took us over eight years. One of the very first shots for that documentary was in this room when they were discussing plans. And I remember it well. And I'm honestly amazed that piece of footage lasted eight years <laughs> and made its way into the documentary. Uh, we recently have started an IGTV, which is Instagram television channel on the city's Instagram account. And basically think of vertical and now horizontal. So that's what IGTV is. I just released a low head dam video on that today. That's doing quite well. We've got over a thousand views on that. A lot of people didn't know that that was happening. That's an exciting project. And it's an exciting way for us to share the message. Um, the uh, other new thing that we're doing now is we're streaming the meetings on YouTube as well. So we have five concurrent platforms that we are on right now. We are on channel 12 high definition, channel 12 standard definition, which I would not recommend. YouTube, Facebook, and the city's website all concurrently wow. right now. So hello viewers, thanks for watching. <laughs> and the other unique project that I undertook this year was obtaining my remote pilot license. And that's for the, the drone. We've seen some of that drone footage in the Lowhead Dam project and it's come into use for other purposes for the police department. Public Works has a keen interest in it and being able to fly their projects pre and post so they can see what a road looked like before they went in and constructed it and then come in afterwards and be able to document exactly what was done and what wasn't done. 
Any questions for me? What's your favorite Channel 12 show? <laughs> <laughs> Quick tips. Quick tips, yes. Oh, yeah, there's a question for you. Is that Photoshop or is he on a burning couch? The trick Art question, machine. it's not Photoshop, it's Art After machine. Effects. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for me. Well, we just appreciate what we do, Derek. I know that uh, video is becoming more and more important in our communication strategy, but I think we're, we're spoiled in terms of having someone that's passionate about this. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Derek, are we going to continue with the, the quick tips now that Officer Snyder is rotated out of the, the community services officer position? That is a discussion that is still kind of ongoing. We'd like to. It depends on Eric's availability as he's on day shift. Mm -hmm. uh, Officer Kruger does not have an interest in continuing that particular <laughs> series, but we might come up with something new. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yep. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, I'm Mark Lambert, city attorney, and uh, <laughs> here to talk about the uh, the legal department and our budget, which starts on page 228 of uh, your packet. Um, uh, the city of Ames legal department, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say, is fully staffed. When I was here last year, we were on the verge of that, but uh, we have been fully staffed for about a year now. And uh, that has made a big difference, and, uh, and it's very nice. By the way, this is <clears throat> the second time I've been in front of you for a budget presentation, but the first time as city attorney, because I was interim city attorney last year. Mm. Um, but uh, our goal is to provide high quality legal services and, uh, um, and, and to do it in a way that's responsive. And that's, uh, that's been, a, been a big push in our office to uh, make sure that we're uh, responsive to the city departments and um, and uh, get things handled in a, in a timely fashion and uh, and that we're available um, and you know we get a lot of calls from uh, uh, various departments sometimes with a very quick or very urgent legal question and uh, you know we do have a process it's like you want us to review a contract send it to our legal inbox email we we um, put it into our tracking system, our computer system, we, we then assign it to an attorney. But sometimes uh, departments have really immediate questions. And uh, I was pretty proud of, uh, got a question one day at five o'clock and it was from a department head, emailed me right about five o'clock. He needed an answer like right away. The next morning I grabbed the other two attorneys. I said, we all three need to brainstorm on this and look at different aspects. And so we came up with an answer and by 9.30 in the morning or so, we had a response back to him. Um, so we, we try to be responsive and we've, we've made a real effort of that. <clears throat> I'm going to show you my staff. And of course, I'm in the middle. Um, and, uh, but uh, let's look at the back row first. Uh, Becky Ripke, who's uh, been with the city for a long time. She's our legal technician. Becky's the one that puts the ordinances into the ordinance format. So she's very good at that. And, and that is a very sort of specialized technical thing to get it in the format and go through and write that little paragraph at the beginning that says, you know, removing paragraph, you know, subsection 3A and replacing it and all that. Uh, and then uh, she checks it for spelling and grammar and, and uh, uh, but, but gets those into the format that, that we need and you need in order to uh, deal with the ordinances. Uh, Jill Grimsley uh, is um, uh, the, um, I, I, I like to call her the, the, the Jill of all trades because she kind of uh, helps to uh, run the office and, and keeps track of everything and the big picture wise and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and really supervises the other two support staff. Uh, Ann Lelis is our paralegal who's been with us a couple of years now, um, came to us, she's a, uh, uh, a native of, of not far from here. And then uh, she'd been in Chicago working for a big litigation firm. And then she uh, came back to Iowa. And uh, and so she's uh, been a real addition to the office. Uh, you know, we've got some litigation going on right now and have discovery requests from the other side where they ask us for documents, you know, every email on this topic. And and uh, Ann coordinates all that. She did that at her old job. She knows how to do it. I can just turn that over to her and, and let her do it. Um, the three lawyers, uh, again, me in the middle and uh, 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 to, to the left in the photo, uh, my right in the photo is uh, Vicki Fielmeyer. Uh, Vicki came to us about two years ago, 20 years experience doing real estate law, develop, working for a lot of developers. So 
She knew development work. Uh, she handles most of that kind of work in our office, so we all do a little of it, but Vicki by far does more than anyone else. And uh, so it's very nice to have her expertise. Um, and our new hire, uh, Jane, Jane came in, Jane Chang, she came in and posed for this picture that is actually the same picture from last year, but uh, came and posed for the picture before she had actually started. And, uh, and Jane is with us tonight. So Jane, if you could stand up, um, <clears throat> that I'd introduce her. You'll be seeing Jane uh, soon on the short-term rental ordinance because she's been working a lot on that. So she'll be here when, when you discuss that. But uh, Jane uh, was a prosecutor with the Story County Attorney's Office and then uh, for a couple of years then came to work for us. Um, and she's also a scientist. She has a master's degree from Yale and some sort of chemistry that I've never heard of. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so we're, we're uh, uh, very happy to to have her and have her expertise. But of course, like all three of us, we all work on a lot of different issues in the office. Okay, what we do, we advise the council, staff, boards and commissions, represent the city in all sorts of matters, uh, draft and review ordinances and contracts, other legal documents, uh, litigate uh, and uh, assist and coordinate with outside council on litigation matters. And I should add on that, that's actually a pretty big job when, you know, you might think, oh, well, there's this litigation and we've got an outside counsel handling it. Um, that's, it's true. They're doing the bulk of the legal work, but there's a lot of support work that we have to do. And so we're the ones to uh, coordinate that. So if, you know, a discovery request comes in and there's lots of uh, things that we have to gather to get to them, you know, it's our office that's in charge of, you know, contacting all the people in the city and, and getting all those documents together and getting them off to the outside council. Uh, when we've had other kinds of uh, litigation, uh, you know, when briefs are written, um, uh, it's, you know, they, I always ask the outside council to run the briefs by me so I can take a look at them and I can give some uh, suggestions or advice on those just to, you know, keep involved in the matter. Um, so we, um, um, Anyway, that's kind of a list of the kind of things we do. Um, here's a chart of our funding sources. It's, you know, uh, detailed more in the written documents, but um, we get uh, money from a variety of other departments and, uh, and most of our funding comes from the general fund. And then uh, budget allocation, our biggest budget item is personal services, which is, you know, the, the staff and uh, that's, who does all the work and you know we don't we don't have anything big and exciting like new fire trucks or a, <laughs> or a, or a uh, you know a new water plant uh, you know our biggest uh, uh, equipment purchase was a new photocopier oh. and uh, but we uh, you know we do all the work with the, the three attorneys and three support staff and 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 it's a lot it's you know it's roughly um, uh, 500 new legal matters that come in uh, every year. Some of them are quick and easy. Um, sometimes uh, they're very involved and, and take a lot of time. So, uh, you know, that, but that's, uh, we, we basically d divide most of the work, you know, three ways uh, between the three attorneys and uh, uh, do our best to, to get that work done in a, in a timely fashion and, and, um, and accurately. So, so that's, that's pretty much the overview for the city attorney's office and I'd be glad to answer questions. On page 229 there, <clears throat> the 2016-17 numbers just seem so high compared to the subsequent years. Was there something really intense going on in 16-17 or do you have a, what do you attribute that? You know, I, I, I know, and I wondered that too when uh, I was, you know, Jill in our office ran these numbers and you know, our software keeps track of it. And, um, and I'm not really sure why they were higher that year. And I haven't gone back and looked at the prior years to see what the numbers are. Huh. Um, so I, I'm really not sure. I, I guess I don't have a good answer for that, but okay. it, it's a... Um, it's, yeah, it seems like in all categories, kind of a big mm -hmm. difference. Yeah. But yeah. I'm just curious, yeah. And... Um, you know, the reality is I, I think it's about 500 legal matters a year on average. So, you know, that year it was more for for some reason. Huh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Just curious, really. Mark, when you came into the job, I think you said there were several new processes you wanted to put in place. 
Have you done that? And do you feel like they're working? Yeah, um, yeah I have and I, I do. And um, the uh, first thing we did was uh, we used to have a staff meeting every week for uh, deciding who was going to take uh, which cases. Now, I could assign them as they came in, but it seems to work better if we do it uh, at a staff meeting. And, you know, because sometimes one of the attorneys will say, oh, I'll take that. Or, I, you know, I, I worked on that, you know, the prior version of that contract two years ago. So I, I'll take that again. And so we do it at a staff meeting. And uh, before we used to have one staff meeting a week and it was a moving target, it would be a Monday one week and Thursday the next week. And so I decided to standardize that. Um, we've been having uh, two staff meetings a week and they're uh, on, on uh, Tuesday mornings and Thursday afternoons. And um, then we you know, take the legal intakes that have come in and we talk about them. And then ultimately I decide, you know, uh, who gets them, I assign them to between the three attorneys. And um, uh, the advantage of do doing it twice a week um, is that, uh, you know, people used to wait sometimes a week or so before they would know, like, who the attorney was assigned to it. And the with the Tuesday and Thursday schedule, people don't have to wait more than a couple business days to know which attorney is assigned to the case. So uh, I think that's been a big help. The departments seem to like that. I've talked to you know, many department heads about it, and they, they really like the fact they're getting a, a very quick response on when, um, you know, who the attorney is, and then they can contact that attorney and work with them directly. So th that's probably the biggest thing that we've done to, uh, to kind of make sure that we're dealing with everything in a timely fashion and keeping it moving along. So, Thanks. Yeah. Mark, on page 228, under char <coughs> charges for services, there's a pretty significant decline in the estimated charges that you'll be receiving. Could you walk us through that line item? Oh, okay, sure. Um, the the biggest difference there is a, a decrease in um, in our uh, uh, work for Mary Greeley, and uh, it's you know we we bill Mary Greeley for the work work that we do for them. <coughs> Excuse me, and um, I think there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, they seem to be relying more on outside counsel, and and not on us so much. Um, and a lot of the work we do for them are reviewing subpoenas that come in. And uh, they used to send every single subpoena to us. Um, they get a subpoena for medical records. They would send them to us to review. Well, I think over the time, they've just sort of realized that they only need to contact us when there's some sort of issue with it or they're not sure. And, um, you know, so they, they've sort of become uh, more expert at at handling those and there's less of a need for them to check with us on on every single one so I, I i know that they respond to a lot of those without checking with us now and and that's because a lot of them are it's very obvious they have to comply with them it's only when there's there's questions but um but that's that's been a decrease it's gone down and and i, I think it's just a factor of again the uh, i think they rely more on on their outside counsel on some other things and then and then we do less subpoenas that we used to do okay thank you sure other questions from Mark? Well, I, for one, appreciate what you do, Mark, and just Thank the fact you. that we can uh, rely on you and Jane and, and your department to help guide us through it. We had a lot of stuff we did last year and looking forward to continuing Thank that you. relationship. I, so. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And I just want to enjoy, uh, add that I enjoy this job. <laughs> <laughs> it shows. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, good evening. Uh, several from the HR staff are excited to present uh, the HR budget to you tonight. Uh, Bethany Jorgensen, our very capable new HR director, was really looking forward to being with you, but unfortunately she's been ill all week and even worse today. And she feels even worse because she's so much wanted to be here, but uh, we'll try to carry on for her. Um, 
said she arrived on November 1st and has really learned a lot and done a great deal to catch up and learn about the city organization and operations and really grateful for her service here. Mm -hmm. And you are? <laughs> Fine. I'm Bob Ken. I was, I was the acting HR director until she got here, and I was involved in the early efforts to prepare this budget, so that's why uh, I was elected to uh, step in in her absence this evening. I'm sure she's watching. <laughs> yeah. Uh, recruitments continues to be a huge part of HR's uh, workload. Uh, last couple of years, we've seen high levels of recruitment. This year seems to be pretty much in line with that. Uh, as of February 1st, we had 64 open recruitments. Now that does include a lot of uh, temporary parks and rec jobs in the summer, but nonetheless, it's a very heavy recruitment load uh, going on. Uh, applications, the last couple of years, we've received uh, over 4,000 applications for city employment. Uh, uh, we appear to be in, you know, moving in that same direction this year. Obviously, it's a tighter job market, you know, and we are, you know, having to work even harder, you know, in some recruitments to get uh, high quality applicants. In order to uh, manage this recruit level of recruitments, uh, the uh, city manager's recommended budget does include an increase of 0.25 FTE to move a principal clerk position to full time. And this would allow that position to play a stronger support role in the recruitments so that the HR officers and HR analysts can devote more effort to the higher level of recruiting functions to try to keep up with that. Um, training and employee development is a really important part of what uh, Human Resources does uh, for the city. We're continuing to uh, build upon and strengthen our efforts in our employee development center, which is kind of a corporate university to help us with internal training and development, as well as uh, power hours, which are specifically designed for our supervisors for their unique responsibilities. A lot of this revolves around legal requirements and uh, helping us stay abreast of the law so that we can be in, in compliance there. Um, as you're aware, we've, we're negotiating with three different employee units this year. Uh, the HR staff has played a key role in these negotiations. Um, we're happy to report that at your next two meetings, we'll be bringing you proposed settlements with two of those units. And then uh, staff is still working very hard uh, on the with the blue collar unit with some of the special challenges that uh, have come up there. Um, I would just comment that in dealing with our employees in these publics, in the non-public safety areas where so much had to come out of the, the uh, labor contracts because of the change in state law, it's been a stretch for them. You know, it's something that we didn't take it away, but it has to come out of the contracts. But we've been doing our very best to try to help them appreciate that they're not losing benefits. They're losing something out of a contract, but we provide the same service to them or the same benefits whether or not it's it's in a union contract. Um, let me see, just two last, that's the last slide I have. Two last, just quick comments. One of them, uh, as you carefully studied every page in the budget, you may have noticed that, you know, there's an increase in both years here for uh, contractual services to help us in our excellence through people, uh, organizational culture effort. That's already paying big dividends. We're just really, appreciative of your approving this funding. Uh, Donna Gilligan has been the outside consultant who actually has been with us since before ETP was even invented. She has a great deal of organizational you know, history and connection and, and is really uh, helping us grow in that area now. We think that's a really important area to invest in because it, you know, it clarifies that our goals are to provide exceptional service at the best price. We want everyone to understand how they can do that and to provide an enjoyable and stimulating work environment. So the other thing I'd mention is uh, we're really excited just right now after quite a bit of uh, effort over the last probably six months that uh, a new diversity and inclusion team of city employees 
is at this moment being formed. Uh, Donna uh, helped us to put together a good charter and you know operating guidelines for that team. We're seeking uh, volunteer members from among the city workforce right now. And this new diversity and inclusion team will begin its work next month. Just to us, it's just a really exciting step forward to uh, increase our uh, capacity as an organization to have an inclusive uh, environment here where people will want to, come, want to come and then they'll have the growth opportunities that everyone deserves. So any questions for... <clears throat> oh, sure. Okay, a third item I'll mention. Um, He's forgetful, I have to remind him. <laughs> <laughs> um, over the last several months, we've been working on updating the city's personnel policies and procedures, as well as the Civil Service Commission's policies and procedures. Met this morning with the outside law firm and helping that along so that uh, by the end of March, we should have before you updated personnel policies and procedures for your consideration. And uh, you know, then we'll roll those out over the you know months that follow. That, that hasn't been done in like 15 years and it really needed a lot of attention. So uh, looking forward to achieving that. Anything else? Questions for Bob? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I just want to say on behalf of council, we're going to miss you. And you've done a tremendous job. And uh, I was asking Bob, what's, what do you want to accomplish before you're done? <laughs> For those of us who have been in small business realize an employee handbook is not an easy <laughs> lift. <laughs> and that's falling to Bob. And he's working with somebody else. He says, I want to have that done before I leave. And it's like, wow. I mean, he's not going out with a whimper he's going out with you know pedal to the metal let's go let's get this thing done so anyway so that process could keep him here for a really long time well, we hope so in it out yeah we hope so i mean i think that steve was pretty smart you know you, have to, you can't leave till it's done mm -hmm. so anyway but i've heard that more than once yeah <laughs> yeah thank anyway. you okay now on to your other uh, elements of the hr budget bill walton is our risk manager Good evening. I'm going to uh, give a, what I promised to be a brief overview of, of risk management uh, for the city, pages 248 and 249 uh, in your book. We have four major activities in the risk management area, and that's purchasing property insurance, liability insurance, settling claims, um, monitoring uh, the self-insured workers' compensation claims, program and also the safety program. Our largest expenses are property premiums and liability premiums. Um, last year, we were able to uh, move the power plant program, saving the city approximately $90,000 mm -hmm. over um, the previous carrier. Um, we also neg negotiated a flat rate for the 1920 uh, policy period. So the only change we might see will be in uh, increased values in the actual value of the, the power plant and the property. Some of our initiatives, um, we're establishing a citywide safety team. Uh, my understanding is there's been one in the past. Um, what we want to do is harness the uh, successes of some of our departments. Uh, I don't want to necessarily steal Don's um, show here, but he's got two departments that have uh, two that have, <clears throat> excuse me, have gone without a lost time accident over 600 days. Ooh. And that's fantastic. So if we can take what they're doing and, and spread that across the city, um, I think we can benefit everybody and get, get everybody home safely at the end of the day. Um, we also then will take a quick look at um, how we do safety training in the city. See if we're doing it the best way we can, if we're getting the best value for our dollar, that sort of thing. Uh, we also plan to take the excess workers' compensation coverage to market um, this year. It hasn't gone for several years. Uh, hope to see a drop in that coverage. We've been seeing um, administrative increases, but um, I think if we go and test the market, we can get a better deal. 
And also we'll take the workers' comp TPA service out, the third-party administrative service out. Uh, again, no problems with service, but it's been many years since that's gone out. So uh, we'll test the market there um, and see where, where we land. Um, one of the other things, um, I know fun functional job analysis uh, is uh, an important topic for the council. We ran into some difficulties with the vendor that we'd been using. Uh, I know there are some local vendors that would like to do that work for us, so we'll do an RFP um, so that we can get that program started back up again as well. Is our purchasing policy we adopted five or six years ago apply in a situation like this where the local, a local contractor gets some kind of bid or is that something different? You mean if it's within 1% do they get yeah. a local preference? Yeah. Does that apply in a situation like this? Yeah, I'm not sure it applies to insurance. Uh, it's about insurance policies. Mm -hmm. Usually I think it was um, purchase of automobiles and equipment, but I'd have to check. I don't remember your exact Chris. policy. Okay. If there are no other questions, Any questions? thank you for your or time, Bill? and I will turn this over to Krista Hammer. Thank you, Bill. Good job. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. And it's my <laughs> <laughs> I'm Krista Hammer. I'm an HR officer with the um, HR department, and thanks for having me be this first time to uh, present to you. I appreciate the time, and and hopefully we'll get through this with no sweat on my brow. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, what we're going to do is take a look at page 250 to 251 for the health insurance management piece. <clears throat> And to start out, um, we've had a common um, main service objective for health insurance, and that's to try to keep our um, contribution um, premium rates uh, increases down below at least 10%. And as you can see by this um, chart here, we've actually really succeeded with that. Um, even before um, 1617, it's been well below 10%, but um, we can definitely see that we've increased less and less each year. Um, this next year, we are projecting to only increase by 2%, which is actually fabulous. So even though there might you might see some increases in some avenues of our um, health insurance expenses, um, we're definitely on track to have not much of a, of a health premium increase for our employees this coming year. Yeah. So hopefully that'll go through. Um, and our next thing is talking about um, the expenditures themselves. I um, wanted to kind of just give you a picture, a better picture um, to give you the whole, the whole experience, if you will, for health expenditures. Um, it usually obviously is the biggest piece of pie is usually for your medical claims. They're usually our highest expense, followed by pharmacy claims. And then um, bit by bit, it's bitten away with our dental claims, our excess insurance, um, which is our stop loss mostly. Um, which goes um, for claims that are above 125000 a year in a claim year. And then also our other health insurance, and um, Andrea will pick up after me talking about the health promotions programs as well. But if you're not familiar with this, which I had to do some research, our other health insurance um, area really includes um, our uh, pharmacy benefit um, administrator fees, our Medicare supplemental insurance premiums, um, admin fees and a uh, capitation for both medical dental and also includes our ACA fees too, to operate as um, uh, under the uh, federal regulations. So um, based on that, um, a big piece uh, has been increasing over time is our pharmacy claims, even though they are a lot smaller than our, our medical claims that you can see by the pie. Um, this actually is driven quite highly by um, our um, specialty and non-specialty drug tiers. Um, with, there's just a lot of drugs out there that are new on the market that are a little bit more expensive than, than drugs that have been on the market for some time and actually have a generic equivalent. Um, even though we've done a great job of, of educating people, uh, getting back into considering generic drugs over brand name drugs, there's just these drugs out there that are for genetic reasons that people need to take drugs and you know they're new on the market so 
we have a big, about 50% of the top five drugs that our, our employees use are within these specialty and non-specialty areas. And then really only that's only 3% of our prescriptions. <laughs> so hopefully that puts it in a little bit of perspective, even though it looks like 21% compared to the 61% on our total claims, dental is you know, kind of just a drop in the bucket, but um, we're trying to do our best with that. But again, with these high costs, with the pharmacy drugs that are out there, it's, it's getting a little bit more difficult, but we do want to give a shout out to our employees who have actually taken the plunge and gone from brand name drugs to generic drugs, because that's really helped us in the long run. And that's what I have to present for you tonight. But do you have any questions that I can poss possibly help you with? So walk us through under the recent accomplishments, despite continued higher than average number of high dollar claimants over 125,000, the city is proposing a rate increase of only 2%. So I'm, just, I'm looking to the numbers and I'm having trouble seeing how do you have an increase in high dollar claimants and yet a rate increase of only 2%. That's actually a really good question. Um, it really, we were really shocked also by um, our renewal for 19, or, I'm sorry, 1819, where we thought we were actually going to be coming in higher for expenses on um, our stop loss or excess insurance, which uh, Walmart came back and they didn't give us that much of an um, expense on there. Um, the claimants, we do have above 125%. Um, actually, our, we get, um, uh, revenues back from that insurance. Um, so hopefully that would kind of balance that out a little bit. But um, we only had six claimants this past year ending in um, June of 2018. And we've got just a slightly uh, lower number for starting with 1819 as a, as a fiscal year. Hopefully that helps a little. We've got two stop losses built into our plan. One is on a claim basis. Chris <clears throat> mentioned 125,000. So even though we may have larger claims, that's an attachment point, which we'll get back. And then we also have an overall plan, which I think is 125% of expected claims. Is mm -hmm. that correct? So even if we have a large number of other claims, we, we do have a top end where we would collect back from the reinsurance industry. So what really kind of would hit us more is if we had numerous 60 or $80,000 claims, because we would pay 100% of those. Mm -hmm. Uh, on these ones, and some can go on for years, isn't that correct? Yes. So these larger ones, and then we're we're limited on our, on our losses on those. And and also remember, we put this in a fund, a separate fund. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we have good years, we bank it. We have bad years, we draw down the fund. You don't have to necessarily raise the fees, uh, raise the fees each way. That's why it's good to have it in one enterprise fund if you are somewhere a fund like that. Okay, thank you. Anything else for Krista? Good job, Krista. Thank you. All right. I'm going to pass the torch to my mentor. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea Cardenas is our health promotions coordinator. Hi. Hi. Um, so, yes, this is my first year in three years that I'm talking about health promotion um, specifically. Um, the past several years, I've been playing a dual role where I've been covering management of health insurance as well as health promotion. Um, and Krista uh, joined us re um, a little over a year ago. A little over a year ago. And so we've been slowly transitioning some of those responsibilities back. So um, I'll be talking about health promotion. So uh, one thing I wanted to talk about is just about um, so much collaboration and uh, that we see across the Ames community. My main role here for the city is working with our employees and focusing on their health. But I also get the opportunity to work with Healthiest Ames and some of the community initiatives that we have going on in the Ames community. Uh, Healthiest Ames um, was recognized as a finalist for Healthy Hometown. So you can see on the slide there, just some of the accomplishments that we've had in the past year. Um, so I've been involved in the school gardening program as well as uh, leading the Ames Worksite Wellbeing Collaboration, which is a group that meets every other month um, of Ames employers to talk about things that they can do <coughs> for their employees in the Ames community. Um, we also have a new project that we're working on, um, partnering with Primary Healthcare. They have a, a program called Farm to Clinic where the physicians give their patients a prescription, not just for medications, um, but for 
vegetables. And the, the patients bring that prescription back into the clinic and they're given vegetables as part of their treatment plan. Uh, we're looking to expand that in the Ames community and just recently formed another um, partnership with Mary Greeley, um, Salvation Army, uh, Primary Health Care, and um, even a, a local farm, mustard seed farms, uh, to expand fruits and vegetable access in the Ames community. Um, in addition, we all, I also participate in a local collaborative with Mary Greeley, Iowa State, and McFarland Clinic. And we meet as employers to really look at what are our opportunities uh, to really look at what, is, what do we have in common uh, as a way to help improve the health of our co collective employees. We've, we recognize that uh, people on our health plan may be a spouse of someone who works at another organization. And so when we make an impact for our employees, we could also be impacting each other's health claims um, in a positive way when we're implementing wellness programs. So we've done a lot of work with that group, uh, really looking at opportunities for reducing pharmacy costs, um, which is not unique to us. Uh, it's something we're seeing nationally driving healthcare costs, uh, but also looking at what can we do at a local level. Uh, in addition to that, we've really been trying to look at data uh, and using that to drive decision making. So we actually came up with a new way to capture data for our employees and insured. Uh, to, to get a look at what's happening in our population so that as we make changes in the workplace and for health promotion that we can measure that impact. Um, in addition, uh, the health promotion program that is focused on the City of Ames employees, um, this here just gives you a snapshot of the different types of programming that we offer. Three things that we focus on are increasing awareness of health conditions and health, um, improving health habits, and then ultimately improving well-being of our workforce. Uh, we've seen significant growth in some of our programming in the last several years, uh, increase in flu shots 30% just in the last couple of years over um, just building more and more people that are able to get that flu shot. We offer that service, we bring it out here uh, and employees can go to the break room and get their flu shot and get back to work. So we make it as convenient as possible for people to stay healthy. And in addition, our Healthy for Life program um, it's been going on since 2006. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the Healthy for Life program is a program that employees do a baseline health screening and they participate in the program and they're paired with a health coach throughout the year. So they're given support for behavior change. Um, we've seen significant decreases in um, health care um, as, as far as utilization and also as far as um, health risk. So we're able to see that people are lowering their blood pressure, they're lowering their cholesterol, they're improving their blood sugar, um, and they're also reducing their waist circumference um, over time. So uh, we actually, I looked at some data for members of it in the program for 10 years. So as they've been able to age 10 years, they're still healthier today than they were 10 years ago. So really proud of some of the accomplishments we've been able to make uh, with that program. Um, and as if you notice in the, um, in the budget book, that's what's driving that increase in, in the health and promotion fund is really the, the increasing utilization uh, that we're seeing in our health promotion programs. So any questions you guys have? Do you, <clears throat> just curious, does the city or any departments have like a <clears throat> bike walk incentive program for um, for employees? And is that like by department? Just curious. We, we don't have a bike walk incentive program, um, but we do have the bikes that employees can can check out and take to different locations. And we also have different um, indoor walking paths that we have at the library um, here at City Hall um, and in other buildings throughout. So employees have an opportunity to be active at work um, as well as um, bike when the, when the weather yeah. allows. <laughs> yeah. Well, when the weather allows. <laughs> <laughs> well, most recently, yes. I've seen, I've seen a few people out on the road. <laughs> Very crazy, crazy they're really crazy. <laughs> one of them is one of our employees, actually. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're very dedicated biker. I like it. Yeah. Do you uh, track to... metrics in terms of, like, the impact that, in terms of absenteeism or just general right. health of, of Yeah, so um, we haven't measured um, presenteeism and absenteeism. That's um, future valuation that I'm working on. Um, but we have been able to measure outcomes as far as reduction in health risk, and particularly for members in the Healthy for Life program. So over the last 
uh, members that are in the program in the last four years had a 60% reduction um, in chronic disease. So when we saw people that came in with a uncontrolled chronic condition, they were able to improve that to a healthy range. Um, so when you look at how that compares to the industry standard, we're ahead. Um, we're actually 10% ahead of what other um, similar programs are seeing. Is this supposed to be employee stress reduction? <laughs> and if so, Dwayne's not doing it right. He <laughs> 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 just said that. Yeah, we why he had calculator. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> Um, so I, I led a training, Mindfulness for Leadership, last uh, last fall, and I convinced, uh, after our health rate setting meeting, I convinced this group to post for a picture <laughs> for med that they're meditating to use in my presentation. Um, Dwayne just couldn't let go of his calculator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he needs work. <laughs> Can you, uh, do you may, Alice, you're probably familiar with the Healthy Life Center concept. Have you been engaged in that at all? And can you comment on like, what the impact might be on community health and also uh, em employee health? Yeah, so um, one thing uh, with the community health center, uh, a lot of our employees have access to the gym here in City Hall, uh, but something that I hear frequently is that it's just not enough um, space. We don't have, I mean, certainly to serve our entire employee population, we just don't have the resources. So just alone uh, to have a space dedicated to wellness like that uh, will be huge for, for just our employees. <coughs> Um, in addition, there's been a lot of interest in doing like um, learning how to cook healthier, mm -hmm. uh, practicing making healthy recipes. And we don't have a place to be, to be able to do that kind of demonstration and practice. Uh, and so having the, like the, um, the healthy kitchen and the teaching center in there would be really helpful for our employees. Um, if you look at healthiest aims, you know, we focus on physical activity, uh, healthy eating, social connectedness, and chronic disease awareness. And so the Helping Living Center really encompasses all those four areas. And, and that aligns with, um, also for City of Ames, uh, we focus on a lot of those areas as, um, in addition to financial well-being and some other areas of well-being. So. Any other questions for Andrew? What, what you've been able to accomplish <clears throat> with our city employees really in some ways is a, a almost a commercial for what we want to see happen in the community. I mean, it's really remarkable and I appreciate the holistic approach. Mm -hmm. We have healthier employees, they're happier, they miss work uh, less. And so just, that's a great sort of commercial for what we're trying to see happen broadly across the community. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right. Item C, public safety program, street light, storm warning system. <coughs> we didn't know if Don was going to make it back, so <laughs> we've got him either on tape or in person, so we've got a choice. <laughs> we'll take the tape. Which one's tape? <laughs> <laughs> Tape will be Don, you yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, Don. Yeah. Which, <laughs> which, which is shorter? Uh, well, I'll tape was 23 minutes. Oh, my God. Oh, no, Seriously? Then. Yes. Okay, well, then you have a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, but nobody Eat was asking that. me questions, so it was pretty easy. Good evening, uh, <laughs> Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the Council. Donald Kahn, Director of Electric Services. Also sitting at the table with me is Brian Trower, the Assistant Director. Others that are in the room, I mean... Look here, Ken Tarks, uh, Technical Services Supervisor. We have Mike Brown, who's our manager of our distribution system, and Lyndon Cook, who's the manager of engineering. So when we get to the questions, uh, that's, that's the group that's gonna answer it. Um, before we get into electric, um, one of the areas that the electric department works very closely with our police is on community protection, and there are two sub areas of that that we deal with. Um, this should be found on page 52 if these slides are correct, because I think my notebook said a slightly different. You're right. All right, cool. Um, basically, this is two two, car two categories, street lights. Um, these are not the signal lights, but the street lights that light our street, and then also our storm warning system. Um, based on this slide, um, our expenditures for 1920 is a, close to a million dollars. That's up about 5% from last year's adopted. And the increase is basically due to uh, additional uh, street lights that we're putting in. We're also spending some more money on the storm warning system. Uh, unlike the electric uh, 
department, uh, these funds actually come out of the general fund. Uh, moving on to electric services, this basically starts on page 58. Um, and let me talk through that. So we have several different divisions within electric services. Electric admin is one of them. Uh, that particular division is up about 3% uh, to 1.1 million uh, from 1819 adopted. This is found on page 60. Some of the things that we're focusing on right now, we're developing the city's first community solar farm. Uh, we're at about 61% right now. Uh, we are um, talking to people like the school district to see if they if somehow we can work together with the school district and several of our customers that are interested in, in going greener. Um, it makes it kind of interesting just because of the structure that we do. We look for the money up front in most cases. So we're looking at some creative approaches that we can take with some of our unique customers like the school district, like Iowa State and things like that. Excuse me, Don. Iowa State's a partner already. Is that correct? Iowa State is a partner in that, and, and you, you, you used the word correctly. They're, they're literally, we're going to be the ones that are going to be on the hook, but we're going to sign a, a companion agreement that, that basically resells a portion of the output from that solar farm to Iowa State, similar to how we did it with our wind contract. So they haven't purchased any of the power packs, but they are, it's a different agreement, is that right? Or? Correct. I mean, they're in essence going to be purchasing power packs, but Due to the nature that they're going to be here for a long time, they don't need to bring the money up front. It'll be a continual payment. Thank you. Um, other thing to mention, electric system peaks. This is, this is something critical to us. If we would continue to hit new electrical peaks, we have to start worrying about building new generation. If we have to build new generation, we have to start looking at how that affects rates, probably do a rate increase. So through our demand side management programs, this has been a, a great uh, process where we're able to uh, convince our customers to do what's right and use less energy or less energy when we're peaking. Um, and so we haven't peaked since 2012 was our last electric peak. And we're continuing to try to, to hold on to that. Conversely, which is actually a good thing, our energy usage is up. So as long as we're not using the energy on peak, we're actually making better use of our infrastructure because we're using the wires that are already there and that helps to cover those costs. Uh, we have another eco fair coming up. This is, and I think uh, Susan probably talked about that with her presentation. Our ninth annual eco fair is coming up April twentieth of twenty nineteen. Next area, and this is where we, I started talking about our demand side management program. Since we started this, since council initiated this in twenty in two thousand seven. We believe we've reduced what would have been our peak by 23 megawatts. What that kind of says is, is rather than being a peaking utility of 130, we would have been a peaking utility of about 153, and we'd be talking about another generator. In fact, we already would have needed it in place. From an energy standpoint, um, we believe we've saved about 36 gigawatt hours. Normally, we talk in, in megawatt hours, so this is 36,000 megawatt hours. How we measure that, and it's 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 a little bit of more magic than science, but you can determine that if if somebody puts in a new air conditioner that uses half the energy, we then take that as the calculation. So we know how many uh, air conditioner rebates we've done, how many light bulbs have changed out, and that type of stuff. So it's kind of a calculation that looks at the reduction in that. Um, one of the things we did too this year is, is we wanted to make sure that our, our rebates in this program were meeting our needs. In other words, what were other utilities doing? Were our programs being used right? Were we just giving away money or were we, we truly encouraging people to use our energy wisely? So we sat down, went through that, and then uh, had a report to URAB, went over the findings, and then uh, we implemented the updated rates uh, following your abs approval. Um, from a solar array standpoint, this is on the customer side. We have 136 systems um, that the customers own on their system. It's close to a megawatt or, or 973 kilowatts of, of uh, installed capacity, if you will. And we paid out slightly over $200,000 in rebates through the end of 2018 to encourage our customers to put this in. Um, we've started this last year to, again, as a, as a method or a tool in our toolbox, we uh, created an industrial interruptible rate. 
we had one customer that used that and we did not have to call them. We did not see or get even get close to a new peak this last year. But we have that again in our toolbox that uh, we have the ability then to call them and they can shed load. And we have some checks and balances in there to make sure that it works right. Now, before you go on, so finish the story. So on, with respect to solar, 218,000 paid out. So are, is the city happy with that number? Or is it, how, what's your assessment of that? Um, well, huh. happy, are we happy with that? Um, it, interesting question. What we, what we, what we do with the rebate program is, is we are encouraging our customers to put in, um, uh, solar. I, I don't want to say it's happy, but we treat it the same way as we would give somebody a check f to get a, a, uh, uh, energy efficient air conditioner. So, um, I don't know if I'm happy or unhappy. It's good that they've put in solar. It's good that we're supporting it. Uh, I think we're we're getting the right amount of solar. I'm hopeful that the reason why the solar installations has slowed down a little bit is a lot of people are interested and really excited about SunSmart Ames and hoping that they are, rather than put it on their own home, and there's pluses and minuses to that, they're looking at this 2,000 kilowatt uh, farm that we want to start construction on this year. So I think the rebates that we have for the program are fair and, and justifiable. Um, and I think we have plenty of systems out there that, that are a good addition to the, to the generation in the city. So I, I don't know if I'm answering your question. It's, it's we a had fair a very number. robust conversation about this from this first. Well, point. I think well, net metering is going to be coming back to us yeah, we'll soon. Yeah. So but there I don't is. Know. You asked for a separate report. That'll this. be coming back mm -hmm. in a okay. meeting or two, I think. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And, and and since you touched on that report, and and that's in 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 uh, my uh, on my to do list, this two hundred eighteen thousand. These are rebates to install. This has nothing to do with the. The rebates or, or the, the money that we would pay to purchase energy that is produced in excess. That's a totally separate uh, thing out there. And um, uh, the report will cover that in more detail, how that how that shakes out. Great, thanks. And, yep. Um, I have a question on another topic. Yeah. I may? Yes, sir. Um, so in the participants in primetime power, it, it shows at, at approximately uh, 10,000 participants now. What's the, the top end of that that we can hope for? Boy, um, to be honest, I think 10,000 is, yeah. is very, very, very good. Since it's a volunteer program, yeah. um, having that many systems out there is really good. They're, they're, um, you know, we can, we can always add more, um, but uh, I believe if you think about how many residential meters we have, what are, how many? Yeah, that's 20, kind, of, kind of the question, I guess. 000. So we have about 27,000 okay. residential meters. It's a little bit hard to measure that because some may be apartments and, and things like that. And, okay. and would you put a switch on everybody's house? But sure. 10,000 out of, out of, out of 2,400, 2,700 is actually very good saturation. <laughs> and uh, we do have some things built into our rebates that say if you get a new air conditioner, you you are required to get one of these primetime switches. We, we did not want to move towards a... Uh, a, a situation where it's mandated on everybody's home. We wanted this to be a volunteer program and so that people willingly do it and, and understand that what they're doing for the city rather than just force it on somebody. I understand. And during this last year, was the, the system ever engaged to actually- We did not turn it on this last year. It never on. really got hot. We didn't need it. Let me put it that way. It did get hot, but it's one, again, it's another tool in the toolbox that we would initiate as, as our loads are climbing we have a, a, a huge list of different things we do. We'd send out condition red alerts. We'd get on the radio and we'd be getting on into the newspaper and things like that, encouraging our customers to use less energy during that peak period of time. But we did not have to turn it on this last year. Thanks. Yep. Last thing I wanted to mention on this is the Smart Business Challenge. This is something that was created at our 150, the sesquicentennial, where uh, we actually have interns and together with Mary Rankin, uh, Steve Wilson was very involved in that, and um, Susan Guiazda, where we would literally go out and help customers, help businesses save energy. I mean, walk them through the process. And we've got several customers, I want to say nine now, that are platinum level. And we just recently um, recognized them at a, at a uh, smart business luncheon. 
So we're continuing to encourage people to look at that, businesses to look at that. We're not looking for a uh, an expenditure rate increase. That's why it's it's flat from 1819 to 1920. Moving into power production, this is our generation. This one actually went down slightly uh, from 1819. A couple of things to mention, and I know it was mentioned by uh, Human Resources that as of the 15th of this month, we had 653 days without a lost time accident. That's Knock on wood, that is extremely good. That is very, very, very good. So we wanted to recognize the power plant for having that. We are spending a large investment into specially coated boiler tubes um, because as we continue to burn RDF, we're seeing more and more wastage, more and more wearing on the tubes. And uh, we want to make sure that these, this, these boilers last a long time. And a lot of that's in our capital budget. Um, we did develop an agreement, resource recovery, our, br our brothers and sisters across the railroad tracks. We understand that as we're limited in our generation, if our generation goes down, it also impacts <coughs> them negatively. So we've worked out a way where we can um, continue to burn the RDF, but if we're having problems, we don't need them to suffer also. So we've got an agreement right now in place that uh, once our units are healthy, the agreement is just kind of a backstop and uh, we'll, we'll go back to, to paying for the garbage that we're burning as opposed to this uh, financial stability agreement. <laughs> Mentioned before, Electric Peak uh, on July 12th of <laughs> last year, 124.8 megawatts, all-time peak was back in July of 2012. Okay. Fuel and purchase power, this is the largest division, largest budget that we have. Uh, almost $35 million and it's up 7%. You say, well, my gosh, what's happening? Well, with this one, as energy usage rises, we have to buy more energy. So this is actually up about a little over $2 million because we're buying more energy, but we're selling more energy. So our revenue will, if our, our, if our fuel and purchase power is up 2 million, our revenues are gonna be up similar amount to cover that. Market energy prices remain very low. Um, but we are purchasing, like I said, purchasing more energy. Uh, we're still in, we're in the third year of five-year agreements on our natural gas. In fact, we're looking at doing some extensions that could actually lower our average price. If we buy cheaper natural gas, we'll actually have a cheaper uh, power plant to run too. We are purchasing excess solar. Um, trying to think the number off the top of my head, we're paying our customers roughly about $50,000 a year for excess uh, solar right now from customer owned generation and it'll be in the report that's that'll be coming up shortly this past year we had uh, our city was met with 20% uh, of that energy was renewable and renewable be our wind a little bit of solar and then the burning of refuse derived fuel um, helped us to cover that that's up isn't it wasn't it 15% in the past uh, it, this is up a last little year. it was up about I think it was 18% like last year now, I'm thinking wind plus RDF so um, this is up a little bit. We're getting more from the wind. Um, some of the transmission stuff has been fixed and a lot of it depends upon how often and how, how much RDF we're burning. If the plants are stable, reliable and, and running a lot, we continue to get a little bit more energy from that. So wind is what percentage of our portfolio? I thought maybe that wind is, was 15%. Yeah, it, it was closer to about 18, 17, 18% this last so year. So wind, no. wind 18%. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh. Thanks. And then the last thing that we have is we have what's called an energy cost adjustment. This is a, a feature within our rates that if energy prices are high, we have the ability to continue to collect that to keep stable. If energy prices, fuel prices are low, we have the ability to lower that. And so literally, literally, energy cost adjustment is a credit on people's bills. So we have the, the filed rate, the approved rate by council, but because the department is doing a good job on purchase power and fuel, that uh, we're actually to give back a slight credit to our customers. Um, I see you're both looking at the book. Are you finding something that I missed on the no. on the solder? Okay. You showing me what I should have looked at before. Now you have me questioning myself. No, no, you're great. Uh, <laughs> moving, moving into distribution operation and maintenance, this is up uh, about 5% uh, to 5.7 million from 1819. One of the big drivers is tree trimming costs, and this is even more in the uh, limelight right now if you've, if you've been seeing any of the stuff in the news on uh, PG&E. 
Um, part of the fires, they believe, were caused by the difficulty in trimming trees and stuff like that. So when trees fall into power lines and catch fire in remote locations, it's very difficult for them to do that. So we do not want to have anything like that happen to us. We do a very, very good job on trimming trees. We have a, a contractor that does that. Those costs continue to rise, and uh, we continue to um, want to keep our trees uh, trimmed. One of the things too, uh, uh, I know a lot of the stuff was talked about recruiting earlier on. Um, for us, there are areas where we have difficulty in recruiting. One is linemen. Um, getting a journeyman lineman has been difficult. So we're looking at, at trying something a little different. We repurposed a uh, position, a uh, full-time equivalent position out of the power plant, brought it over to the line department and recommending then that we create an apprentice position so maybe we can grow in-house somebody um, to do that. We have nine lineman positions. I can't remember the last time we were full, a couple of years ago? Yeah, for, a it, for a short period of time, we had all nine. Um, what it does is it does hamper some of our maintenance. It does hamper some of our ability to send three crews out instead of, you know, we'll go with two crews instead of three and things like that. So by having nine or even potentially 10, that really helps us. And uh, although we don't, we're here, we're not here 24 hours a day, we responded to 293 after hours trouble calls. So our, our linemen are on call 24 hours a day. We're not like the fire department where guys sleep out there, but uh, we respond when called upon. And, and so if you think about it, that's 293, that's a lot of uh, calls being called out after hours. Animal guarding continues to be a, an issue. We've got squirrels that like to touch two wires at the same time. <laughs> and uh, by animal guarding it, we're just protecting our little furry friends. Uh, 2019, we should have about 55% of our street lights changed out to LED. Don, do we have any female line workers? We, we do not. Um, I would love to get some applicants female line workers. Um, yeah, but we do not. Um, technical services, basically this is up about 4.3% from 1819 to slightly over a million dollars. One of the things that uh, Ken and his crews are doing is basically looking at making sure we're being proactive rather than reactive on some of our most expensive equipment, which are transformers. I mean, these are half million dollar pieces of equipment. So we're going in there proactively and making sure that uh, uh, oil is good. We've got good seals, things like that. So there's a slight increase here in some of the costs so that we can replenish the transformer oil because we've been in there doing some work and we like to have transformer oil on hand when needed. We're also changing out uh, breakers, um, with what are called SF6 breakers. They're much more modern, uh, operate very, very well, uh, easier to maintain and things like that. And we've also, within this division, um, been putting in what are called automated meter reading. Uh, you're very familiar with what water did. We don't need to do that with every meter, but where it's in a dangerous location, where it's in a hard to reach location, where it's a place where we can't get to, um, we're moving more and more to putting an automated meter reading in and it protects our re meter readers and it uh, allows us to get or allows um, the customer service to get reads faster. You'll walk up to an apartment building and even though you think you have a key to the door, it's locked or they've closed a garage door. And so then it just takes time to get somebody to open that door to, uh, to read the meters. This way we don't have to worry about it. Engineering, I've got, I'm like almost done, like two slides left. So engineering, uh, one of the things that the um, Lyndon and his group was working on, we finished up that one, uh, we had a, one of our high voltage lines we had to move for the, I think it's called a flyover that's still under construction. Um, so we moved a line there, um, all paid for by the DOT, um, but that took a lot of time to make sure we had easements and, and things like that. Lyndon and his team is very involved in the customer solar interconnections. They are decreasing, like I mentioned before, but he goes out and does a, a personal check on them to make sure that they're meeting all of our safety requirements. Talked about relays and breakers before, and there's several CIP projects. If you've been up on top of hollow recently, we're redoing that substation and Lyndon spends a lot of time up there. 
His whole budget's about a um, million dollars, up slightly from 1819. If you look at the entire department now, looking kind of at the at the other side of it, our expenditures are slightly over 60 or 61 million. That's up seven percent. The big driver again being that fuel. You know, um, we're buying more energy, and that's what's driving up the expenditures. On the revenue side, we're estimating revenues in 1920 to be $70 million. We cracked the $70 million threshold. And what, one of the things that we look at, that URAB looks at, is fund balance uh, because we want to be protected. So if anything um, catastrophic happens, that we've got money in the bank. If something bad happens to the power plant, if something, if, uh, something major that takes out equipment, uh, we maintain, today we maintain a, a fund balance a minimum fund balance of slightly over $10 million. This is a number that URAB currently is studying to see if that number should be changed. Should it be 20? Should it be 15? Should it go down? Um, so at the beginning of this fiscal year, we believe our fund balance will be 38.6 uh, million. We are gonna be doing quite a bit of CIP, predominantly in the power plant, if you remember that presentation. So the ending balance is estimated to be slightly less than $27 million. If you take away the $10 million fund balance target, we would still maintain about a, a unreserved fund balance of, of slightly less than 17,000. Excuse me, 17 million. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was quick. <laughs> wow, yeah, I almost blew it there. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, the last thing to point out there is one of the things that we do is, is we compare our rates to our neighbors. Now. Devil's in the details, but if you look at the average of, of the city of Ames rates over the average customer, so we have residential, commercial, industrial, we are 13% lower than our neighboring utilities. That's not to say that we are cheaper than all of our neighboring utilities all of the time. Um, some have cheaper rates for the industrial customers, for instance, and things like that. But on average, um, even with all of the things that we have to do, we're continuing to keep our reach, rates low for our customers. With that said, that ends uh, our presentation and uh, we're open for questions. Questions for Don? Um, I, do, I do have, go ahead. There's one. So something you mentioned at the very beginning, this is, it's not important, but it's on page 61 where you talk about the energy usage and you mentioned something that energy usage is up and that's a good thing. Um, there are some in the community who would say, how can that be a good thing? Shouldn't we be encouraging people to be more conservative and reduce the number? So I understand the, the dichotomy between peaks, but overall usage. But help, help me think through just a couple of sentences, if you can, from a policy perspective, why wouldn't we be encouraging people to, to conserve more and reduce the total uh, amount of energy that we use in Ames? Uh, there's a couple things I would bring up. One is, and this is what's interesting, is we have a certain amount of fixed cost. Okay, We run our power plant to burn RDF. We have contracts to purchase wind. One piece of this is, is our incremental cost for that next kilowatt hour of energy happens to be the cheapest energy that's out there. We, we would purchase it off of the open market. Right. So if you have all of these fixed costs from that standpoint, and that next kilowatt is the cheapest, you can actually blend all of that and get a cheaper overall rate for all of our customers. Um, so that's one piece of it. The other thing is, is our costs continue to rise. Okay, labor, materials, and things like that. So as our costs rise, we don't have a huge, we don't have a lot of, of service territory left that isn't built out. So any kind of growth in the city is probably not gonna happen in the city of Ames electric system. So as our costs rise, the more you can spread those costs out over more kilowatt hours, again, keeps our costs contained. If our, if our kilowatt hours stopped and our costs kept going up, we would be raising rates. I think what you're getting at, it doesn't factor in the cost of, of carbon in, in the environment. Is that what you're trying to get at? Well, certainly that's so part Don, of it. Don's looking at from the minister, or the business uh, yeah, exactly. perspective of the utility, which that's our requirement to do, but it doesn't factor in the impact on the environment, right. which you could add, you could either put that in a formula as a cost or it should be another goal. It's not just to maybe lower the, uh, the unit cost, the lowest unit cost to the customer, 
but but uh, look at the impact on the environment. And that's the debate you're going to have to have, right? Mm -hmm. That's an ongoing debate you're going to have to have. And, and this also doesn't account for any change in, in the, the customer base, the number of people who are asking for energy, right? This is just the total no amount of energy that's being consumed by the utility, right? And so you'd expect that more customers are going to be using more power, even if every customer is using a little less power than they did yesterday. Yeah, so the, you're saying the average consumption per, per customer may be going down, but the total consumption is going up. So we, we could be more efficient per customer. It could be. It might be. Yeah, it does. Or per yeah, household. Actually, we don't, don't know. But we but. increase in the next 40 years in your 2040 plan, we might add, you know, 10,000 right. households. Okay, Which I so think you're seeing as a general trend. One of the interesting things that we're seeing in the National Electrical Code in the next code cycle is the minimum wire size or the service sizes for new buildings is actually going to decrease because buildings are, in general, using less electricity than they have in the past to the point that you can change the engineering calculations to figure out service sizes. It's interesting. So it's remember, interesting. a lot of our growth, think of all the new apartments that came online. They just new. It's new to the market, new to our <laughs> demand. So... It's not that the individual household or individual isn't maybe conserving. It's just that we have a, a broader base of customers. And you'll see that in the next 40 years as we grow. Hopefully as we add more houses and maybe not as many apartments, but commercial areas and industrial areas. So this may be a topic that we say will be a topic. I'm sure that we come back to Don that we'll think about we're, as you know, we're going through this greenhouse gas uh, inventory and we're going to think about our impact in, in perhaps a different way. And so somehow we have to, to balance the uh, business side of the utility with some of these other goals. And we're not going to solve that tonight, but that's going to be part of a conversation. Well, and w w as you bring up, I mean, topics that are sort of deeper that we'll be getting into later. I, I think it's interesting that, and I get why we do it, that we define the refuse derived fuel as renewable. Because hypothetically, what if all the garbage that came in that day was all plastic? I mean, I get that it's renewable in the sense that there's always new garbage coming in. That's renewable. But it's not renewable in the sense that the material is a, from a renewable source, like plastic, for example. So I, that's, that's kind of interesting to me that we define, our, again, I get it that it's renewable, that our customers will always be producing garbage is renewable in that sense, right. but it isn't a renewable resource in the sense that the planet can generate it forever. So I, that's kind of an interesting definition that I don't know that I'm, I mean, I'm not suggesting we change it, but I think we need to think about when we define, oh, 20% of our energy is from renewable sources. You know, that's kind of the definition there is. Yeah. Well, we make sure we break it down so you know Oh yeah, what they are. So yeah. if you want to discount wind or you want to discount um, solar, you can. So yeah. we'll break it down in all those parts. Yeah, and I get and I like I said, I get why we call it that. It's just yep. it's an interesting thought. One other thing I would add that, um, Mr. Garten, you mentioned. So as you as you're looking at going carbon neutral or, or reducing carbon, let's assume you're moving into electric vehicles. Well, that actually creates so you reduce the the burning of fossil fuels but then you need the electricity to power the... Absolutely, no one talks about that. Yeah. It's a very important, I've seen some articles in the journal about this very subject. So it's, if you're only looking at it in isolation of we're not putting gasoline in the tank, okay, but you have to look at it in the net, that somehow the electricity was created. Yep, correct. So, yeah, thanks. Other questions? Thanks for keeping the lights on. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, welcome back, Doc. Thanks for coming, gentlemen. We got it all. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I think so. Well, I think we've um, completed our presentations of our program budget. Uh, I hope over the last four day or one day and three nights that uh, you could come away with an appreciation of the excellent quality of leadership we have in this organization, leading the various departments and producing the various services. I think you also, I hope you have a sense that this organization, the employees of the city of Ames, are dedicated to providing exceptional customer service at the best price and we're committed to our values of excellence through people as <clears throat> we continue to look for ways to improve services and uh, be um, as innovative and creative as we can uh, in providing these multiple services as, you, as you've been exposed to now to our citizens. We're pretty proud of all the, the work, uh, everybody from all levels of our organization 
have been able to um, uh, contribute and improve the service for our customers. I do want to wrap up and get you prepared for next Tuesday because actually the fun's over for us. <laughs> now the heavy lifting's for you because you're going to have to make decisions next Tuesday, right? right? So before we get into that, there were a couple of follow-up questions. I think Nancy wants to follow you, follow you through on some changes. Yep. Uh, we, and we've, we have a packet here. Do you see that packet by any chance in mm -hmm. front of you? So let's start with there was a question about um, perhaps the local option sales tax and whether we have the money in for the um, for the Human Service Agency capital grants. Right. It would be page 261 of the printed document, but there's a handout here called Lo Local Option Sales Tax Fund. It's an updated one. Nancy, you want to go over that? Wait, let me get it. It should be at the very back of your packet. There's two revised fund sheets from the funds that we went over last Friday. So we did discover after we checked that although the Human Service Capital Grant Program is in the budget, so it's in the totals that you would be approving, it was not appearing on the fund page. It had was not on the sheet that dropped into the document. So this is a revised sheet just showing what the balance is with the Human Service Agency Capital Grant Program included. Uh, you can see it's the second from the bottom line uh, on the front page of that under the CIP expenses. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so the impact will be on the unreserved um, fund balance right. at the end. Look at that. Mm -hmm. So it's dropped by 200000 The real number is 250 which is what I recall. It. And then the second question we had was about, um, I don't know if you remember when we were looking at the public safety uh, special revenue funds about what that large grant number was. And uh, so I went back and, and double checked it. And it actually was the grant funding that we added when we redid that CIP page for the uh, police, the citywide radio system. This is on page 264 funding. of the printed document. Tim, maybe it was you. I don't remember. I asked about what that number was uh, in grants. Yeah, so that large grant total was correct. Um, what we did was w went back and redid the page to break it out because it, I think it was showing that it was just part of operations on the original page and we broke out so you can see the separate grant for the radio uh, system and then show that it's it's in support of that CIP project. The fire department has submitted a grant. They're pretty optimistic they can help pay for the purchase of their radios in the system. Okay, remember that question? I don't know if you remember it. But that brings us back to the whole CIP page on radios. Yeah, which is... Which is in your packet, too. Yeah, also. So, so we put the decision packet together, and then the kind of the information following, it just kind of follows along in the format for how you'll be making the decisions next Tuesday. We you show the CIP? Yep, so the CIP page should be right after your decision. The Showing all the decisions, there's the revised CIP, which was presented uh, when we did the CIP presentations, but it is different than what was Printed. in the document, the CIP document, although these are the totals that are included in the budget. So you see the grant in there too? See the grant? And then you've got the abated debt and then the, the geo bonds. So remember, we had a million dollars this year we've already, uh, already issued, and then the 1.75. And... I want to caution you again, we're not done negotiating. Those numbers could change. That's the scary part. We've got to lock in before March without really knowing the number. Uh, we're hoping it's not going to be any higher. It could be. If it's lower and we issue too many bond, too much bonds, we can use that the way the bond uh, issue is written. We can use that revenue for streets or other projects that, are, that we issue bonds for. It's my understanding from discussion at EMS that the part of the negotiations and this is a question that several communities had, was the ability to buy or purchase radios after the initial bulk purchase at the same rate versus getting penalized. And, you know, for, if a radio costs, let's say, 5500 bucks, that they buy one in a year or two, it's not going to cost them $9,000, essentially. So well, is, is that an option, too? If we let me to just say, we haven't picked which... Right. I think there's two options. We haven't picked which one we're going. Then no, you have to negotiate with the, right. the final one to lock in all those issues. And that's part of the negotiating they're trying yeah. to do is find nothing and get more. What I understand is uh, once the team is prepared to make a recommendation, it has to go back to each one of the funders, one will be at the council, and you will, in essence, uh, give your authority to the city's representative on Storycom to vote for the, to vote for the, um, the, the company you want. And that should be, I can't tell you what's going to be in the near future, but probably past uh, 
March certification. We'll have to see. Okay. Uh, Nancy, you want to go through then to get them prepared for uh, your decisions in order to make them? Yep. So this sheet is the front cover. So this is for Tuesday night. You're not making it tonight. We're just showing you what to think we, about. We, we go. Yeah, I think we're okay. good. You don't want to go through it? Them, but you all remember these? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we won't go through it. Your packet is in there for asset recommendations, outdoor funding, recommend, outside funding recommendations, and also CODA. And public art. Now, I would ask you, if you're going to make any changes on Tuesday, if you could call me so I can help be prepared. Okay. <laughs> the finance department gets very very nervous when you say we're going to call out the police department and we're not prepared to, to make that move. And if you're going to add something, uh, I hope you you can tell me what you want and I can recommend sources. I don't think you should, I don't want to, I don't think you should have to determine the source. We could do that. But it'll be, we'll be scrambling if you do it that night. Uh, so even if you're thinking about something, I could be prepared for it. Okay, if that's the case. What a killjoy. <laughs> well, I don't want those we, to have heart attacks. So. <laughs> yeah. We want to see Dwayne squirm. <laughs> Dwayne's not good at his stress reduction. So you don't want to have him. <laughs> yeah, he does have that. Good. I was wondering. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Any other questions you might have? You have some of the letters of request, too, that we'll receive <clears throat> later on. Any other information we can get you? Get you ready for your big day on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> which will start at 5.15. 5 and then we have a city council meeting afterwards. Mm -hmm. That's Thank all we have. Guys. Great Thank job. You. Yeah. Thank you, Dwayne. Nancy, Steve, staff. It's our pleasure. <laughs> You're fun. <laughs> all right. We'll move on to... Are no disposition of communications to council. So, Tim, I'll start us out with uh, council comments. Nothing tonight. Nothing tonight. Nothing for me. Nope. Nothing. Nope. All right. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. We are adjourned. Thank you.